Sue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, the first thing is I need to make plain. I'm speaking absolutely personally and not on behalf of uh, my party, the Liberal Democrats, although probably the party would be rather happy with the basic uh, outline that you were saying, Paul, because it's a reasonably sit-on-the-fence position, which we've been doing for some time. Um, I've found the day absolutely fascinating, and I've no idea really why Basic asked me specifically to speak, but I know why I came, which was to hear all of the really interesting speakers. There's only been one really difficult issue for me, and that was um, after Professor David Lane had finished giving his explanation this morning, I feel that I'm really never going to be able to eat fish again with the same <laughs> enthusiasm. Um, you know, they clearly are a lot more to them than, than even I thought. I just need to explain how I first became involved um, in nuclear issues because I was perfectly happily working in the world of books as a bookseller um, and I became elected to my parish council in the sleepy village of Chilthorne Domer in Somerset and eventually I was elected um, as chairman of the parish council and one day on my, um, in my chairman's post arrived an instruction from the Home Office that I had to appoint wardens um, to enact the protect, protect and Survive strategy. So obviously I felt I needed to find out far more about this. And I've been aware of all the background stuff in the press. And it was about that time Raymond Briggs had published his um, Where the Wind Blows book. So I wasn't completely in the dark about the issues, but I did think I needed to find out more. And the more I found out, the more I became convinced that I needed to get much more involved in this issue, because not just as chairman of the parish council, and I had to write back to the Home Office and say, well, I'm really sorry, but you know, I can't possibly enact this because protect and survive is just, it, 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 I should add, we're very near the Ovalton Air Base, so in our case, we did feel, actually, um, that maybe we could have been a target. Um, and hiding under your kitchen table just was never going to be an answer to a nuclear threat, um, even if you'd stack the kitchen chairs around the table at the same time. So that was how I began to get involved. If you fast-forwarded then to now... Uh, something Heather Williams said this morning um, really struck a chord with me, which was that she'd worked for a decade before really finding out what the effect um, of nuclear weapons on people was. And she really welcomed the humanitarian conference initiative that have been going on. Uh, so there have been three to date. And I think she's absolutely right about that. I think the humanitarian initiative, apart from the fact the UK didn't actually take part in it until a very late stage when the US said it would, and there I must agree with, your, with you, Dominic, that it was a bit a case of following in mother's footsteps there. But it's a very important initiative on the basis that it's really bringing the rest of the countries of the world together to address this issue when the P5++ have failed to do so through the Conference for Disarmament for some 16 years, there's been really no movement at all. Um, and I think that there is a certain point when the other countries of the world, of whom, of course, there are far more um, than there are the, the nine or so nuclear powers, are really going to push forward with this. Um, and you could say, well, they're pretty small and they don't have the same clout, obviously, as the US, and they don't have the economic clout. But they are beginning to see that there are avenues, the legal avenue, for instance, that the Marshall Islands has been taking its case against the UK, um, which I think is just... Um, the start of something much bigger. Now, of course, I listened to um, the debate recently in the Commons on the renewal of Trident, and I don't know how other members of the audience here today felt about it as an in-depth debate on renewing our nuclear capability, but I felt that it really re-ran a lot of the issues that could, 
could have been said in the 80s and the 90s with the added spice for some people that, of course, the Labour Party is in a difficult position because um, its leader is very um, strong in his opinion about abolishing nuclear weapons uh, in the face of lots of his party who don't feel like that. And that was unfortunate in the sense that I think it allowed people on all the other benches to focus much more on that uh, and the split in the Labour Party than on the issues and the, some of the things that have come up today. Are we looking at um, something that even in 20 or 30 years' time is going to be so past its sell-by date? Um, in the House of Lords, the uh, debate actually happened with so little notice that most people who are vaguely interested in this issue, or those that are very interested, weren't even there because we got effectively two days' notice of it. Um, which is really unusual because usually you get three weeks notice but we wouldn't have had a vote anyway but at least we'd have been able to make some comments. Um, the other thing that has changed I think for the worse since the 1980s is that younger generations have totally other priorities now. They don't really see this as a crucial issue um, and quite rightly climate change is much higher up their agenda. Um, but of course, the two you know, are linked. It would be ridiculous to suggest that climate change isn't going to create some tensions that may produce really dangerous situations. So I think re-involving younger generations, uh, the younger generation in the debate is absolutely critical. And that's not just because I'm a unilateralist, it's because I think even if they came down on the side of renewal um, from an informed and interested position, that they would have been making a decision about their future. I don't feel on the whole at the moment they are making that decision at all. So I think that has been a very, for me, particularly difficult thing that the focus has moved so far away from the issue itself. So the sorts of questions we've heard about today in terms of um, would submarines be detectable, the drones are clearly going to become more and more economically um, accessible for everybody. So any country in the world will be able to track the submarines is the thought. And in one way, that's quite an optimistic thought because all of the nuclear free zones that are expanding and expanding um, those people are going to be able to make sure that actually the nuclear weapon states are not going to be able to um, have anything in the, the zones where they shouldn't. So I think that for me is a, quite an optimistic issue. Um, I think that actually where the UK was leading with climate change was a very interesting point because if you cast your minds back some 15 years climate change wasn't really an issue and as the debate started to heat up at the beginning of this century or heat up that's a terrible pun um, but people began to discuss it there were pretty set positions from each of the parties and most people didn't know much about the science However, in that case, what we did was we had a draft bill to discuss a consensus around climate change and what we would do with it, which really drew out some of the issues. And I think it's a shame that on Trident Renewal, we didn't have such a cross-party discussion building a consensus, uh, taking us to the next stage, whatever that would have been. Because if we're really going to commit that much money, which it looks like we will to the renewal of Trident, that's going to be an increasingly difficult thing to do. And I think Nick Charles put it very interestingly this morning when he talked about the ragged edge of maintaining these capabilities. I think ragged edge is a very good description and it's going to become more and more ragged. The last issue I'd want to touch on as to what's changed is, of course, Brexit. Brexit does leave us still with all the fairly recent alliances, military alliances that we've signed with the French. But 
Uh, it leaves us with a relationship with NATO, of course, but it leaves a really very different picture and I would suggest a much more insecure UK because we don't know where our position is going to be in the world. So I think for the next decade at least, um, it's going to be a really difficult issue just in terms of military and foreign policy to, to have any firm decisions made because we've effectively, with the Brexit vote, thrown all that up in the air and it will be increasingly difficult um, to make any really firm decisions. So those are my few thoughts to, to feed into this um, very interesting day, Paul, and thank you so much for inviting me.